I think we're I think we're off. There we go. So second run at the at the cardiovascular system today. Uh, obviously, the last time was when we had the uh, bit of a bit of an issue with uh, YouTube allowing the stream to go ahead. Still yet to still yet to hear back from them. Uh, but we did manage to do a, a GCSE lesson live yesterday with with no issues. So we're going to go again. Uh, but like I said yesterday, if the stream does uh, does drop uh, due to whatever reason YouTube have. Uh, YouTube have sorry. Uh, I am recording recording this, so I'll keep rolling uh, as I would have been doing live anyway, and I'll record it. I'll upload it um, post post finishing, and I'll and I'll email out the the URL link so that you can still watch the full lesson. It just won't be live as such, but you'll still be able to benefit from from whatever whatever it is that we cover. Which today, as you can see from the screen here, is the cardiovascular system. Um, so we are going to take a look from the top all the way through, uh, looking at various components of it. Uh, you know what actually what makes the cardiovascular system. What components are there for the vessels, the heart, the blood, etc. The impact of sport and activity on the cardiovascular system, and then we'll take a look through at some of the things which can affect uh, the the cardiovascular system, such as uh, training, such as regular activity, age, health, diet, lifestyle. And then eventually we'll get more towards the performance side of things where we talk about cardiovascular drift and, and things of that nature. So if we dive straight in and we'll have a look at the, the specific objectives that we're going to be hitting as uh, so the impact of activity in sports on health as a whole. So we are going to very briefly cover the four components, uh, emotional, social, um, physical and ooh, we'll cover that in a minute. Um, and then obviously we'll carry on through what controls the cardiovascular system, the brain, the neurological system, um, and then yeah, by the end we'll look at Starling's law, venous return, and cardiovascular drift and arterial venous difference. So without further ado, we will oh, quickly move that out of the way there. So impact of physical activity and sport on health. Now, like I just said. We do have these four, these four components, physical, mental, emotional, and social. So if we have a look, first of all, at emotional well-being, because health isn't just being not sick. It's not the absence of illness, like it says in the blue, blue box there up at the top. It's this combination of all four parts, which leads to someone having overall health. So the first component is emotional. How do we feel? What are our stress levels like? What are our anxiety levels like? Are we getting you know, regular doses of endorphins into our brain? Because endorphins are the feel-good hormone. So if we can get a regular dose of those you know, flooding our brain, that's automatically going to uplift our mood. How can we get those? Well, physical activity is one thing. Success at work could be another. Positive relationships with other people could be um, a trigger for releasing those endorphins. So emotional well-being, having good feelings inside of our body. Second, we have social well-being. So what does it mean to be socially healthy? Well, can we interact with people? Do we have the skill set where we can actually go and talk to someone, go and talk about their problems, go and share our own problems with them? Can we work well with people? You know, have we got the capability to you know, work as part of a team, to be a component of a group that all work towards one common goal? Well, if, if we can't, then you know, social health might be um, on, on the lower side of things. So sport is an excellent way to promote social health. Why? Well, because it challenges people to work with other people in team sports. It challenges people to work on people's strengths and weaknesses. If you know that you're good at a certain part of the sport, then you're going to champion that and you're going to accept responsibility. You're going to have trust from other people in you and then vice versa. If you know that you're weaker in a certain area, you need to trust your teammates more to get the job done. So this, this environment where we're working as a team towards this, this physical goal, it can help develop social attributes. Third component, we have mental. If I just move myself out of the way here. Oh, not with that one. There we go. So mental, whereby it's our ability to think. So our, our quality of thought. So can we, can we make decisions? 
Can we solve problems? How quickly can we arrive at a decision? You know, to be healthy means that we can think quickly. To be healthy means that we can you know, put, maybe put instant gratification to one side and put our longer term goals and happiness um, higher up the list of priorities. So do I need that food now? Do I need to eat that unhealthy option? Or should I avoid that and go for the healthier option because long term I know it's going to benefit my body, my mind and my recovery more. So mental health, this ability to think correctly, to think in a way that's positively going to affect your own situation, be it everyday life, but also in sports. And thirdly, I'll move that again. Sorry, fourthly, I should say, we have our physical health. So physical health isn't just this absence of illness. It's this ability to complete daily tasks without the onset of fatigue. So if you normally walk to work, good health would suggest or would require you to be able to walk to work without getting out of breath, without feeling tired, without having aches and pains for the next day or so. If you need to cycle to work, the same can be said for that. If you need to climb flights of stairs every single day, and you can do it without feeling the, the side effects of fatigue, aches, DOMS, everything like that. If you can do that, that would suggest you've got adequate physical health for your day-to-day -day tasks. Now, if we take an elite sports performer who needs to train twice a day, they need to compete at the weekends and midweek, like a, I don't know, a pro footballer, for example, playing in the Premier League, you know, they've got multiple games a week. Well, their physical health, that needs to be of such a higher level because their daily tasks and daily outputs and movements are so much harder than your average person. So their physical health needs to be at a level where they can achieve all of the things they need to achieve without the onset of undue fatigue. Can they do two training sessions on Monday and wake up ready to go on the Tuesday morning? Yes, no, maybe. Well, physical health is us being able to, to meet our daily needs. If we can do that, that our bodily systems are going to be you know, in inadequate condition. And if we now focus a little bit more in on cardiovascular health, well, if we can do all of these regular day-to-day -day things, then our heart is going to be strong enough. Our blood is going to be healthy enough. Our vascular system is going to be responsive enough to be able to shunt blood wherever it needs to go. Right, we shall move down, or we'll move on, I should say. So coronary heart disease, this is something which I just I sort of mentioned a, a little bit just then, talking about if we can be physically healthy and we can move, then we're more likely to have a body that's able to, to cope with the demands. And coronary heart disease is indicative of a body that can't cope. That is uh, getting poor nutrition, that isn't exercising, there's high amounts of stress, coronary heart disease could set in. So what is coronary heart disease? Well, there are a couple of types, but essentially it's the blood vessels that supply oxygen and they remove waste from the cardiac muscle. So obviously we know that the heart is plugged into vessels which transport blood all around the body. But the cardiac muscle is, is also a muscle, so needs oxygen, needs a deliverance of nutrients as well. Well, the coronary vessels are the ones that do that. So it's the blood vessels that provide the heart the oxygen and nutrients it needs to beat so that it can then deliver blood all around the body. With poor diet, the blood vessels, the coronary blood vessels can start to constrict. Okay, not necessarily themselves, but because we get this buildup of fatty deposits inside these vessels. What causes that? Poor diet, a diet high in fat, or not necessarily high in fat, but higher than our fat output. So if we live a daily life where we conduct low intensity exercise, where we are consuming lots of oxygen because we have low to moderate intensity movements, then we're going to be using our fat stores. Well, if we're using lots of fat stores, then it stands to reason that we can consume a little bit more fat than the average person, as long as we're consuming it. Something called energy balance. 
But what comes in must go out if we're to maintain our current body composition. If we overconsume and have an under output, let's call it, then we've got surplus fatty, fatty consumption, fatty deposits coming in. Where do they go? Well, all around the body into the adipose tissue, but some will collect inside the coronary vessels. And because the coronary vessels are so small and they are so critical, any issues within them can be hugely negatively impactful for the rest of the body. Because if the heart stops to work, then the rest of the body is going to suffer as well. So we know that we could be depositing fats in there. If the fat is getting deposited in there and gradually it becomes thinner and thinner and thinner because you know, the walls of, the, of these vessels are becoming clogged up almost, then less blood is going to be able to get through. So the heart is essentially being starved of oxygen and nutrients it needs to contract properly. What impact would that have in day-to-day -day living? Well, walking around, you might not notice because your heart can work at that you know, resting level or sub-maximal level. But it's when you then go out of your comfort zone and you might go for a jog or a run or you play some moderate to high intensity sport, that's when a person might notice their heart being unable to respond because it hasn't got the scope to. It hasn't got the ability to suddenly ramp up in its output and contractibility because the vessels can't supply it with the oxygen and nutrients it requires to contract at that rate. Okay, so coronary heart disease, it's, it's, it's damage and issues within the vessels that supply the heart muscle itself with oxygen and nutrients. What can lead to it then? Fat deposits, we know. Well, lack of activity. Lack of activity. Every time we, we exercise, we force our body to respond. Okay, we, if, we, if we suddenly run up the stairs instead of walk up the stairs, that new stress is going to cause the cardiovascular system to respond. How does it respond? Well, it increases blood supply. It increases, it vasodilates its vessel so that more blood can go where it needs to go, also known as redistribution or vascular shunt. Well, if we don't regularly force our body to do that, those mechanisms are going to start to get rusty. So... Without regular physical activity, our body can almost not forget how to respond, but it doesn't become as, as fluent, it doesn't become as efficient in responding to exercise. So when we might suddenly, once in a blue moon, go out for some exercise, and we need that blood redistribution and vascular shunt, our body's slow at doing it, and it's not very good at it. The vessels have become a little bit more rigid, less elastic, less pliable, less responsive to neurological control, and vasodilation mechanisms. The issues, or what that could lead to, well, if we've got a rigid pipe which isn't expanding, and then we try and flood it with blood, the blood pressure in that is going to skyrocket. The peripheral resistance, you know, the amount of force being experienced by the walls of the vessel, is going to shoot up because it's not used to being expanded. Imagine if you had, if you had a balloon. If you, you had a balloon, you stretched it first and you blew it up every day 20 times. That's going to be so elastic. It's going to be so easy for you to blow it up and to fill it with a new batch of air every day. But if you took a fresh one straight out of the packet and it's never been stretched or it's hardly ever stretched, it's going to be seized up. It's going to be tough and rigid. So when you do eventually go to blow some air into it, it's going to be so tough. It's going to hurt you trying to do that. Well, that if we just convert that into one of our current vessels, we're trying to force blood into it and they're not used to expanding. They could rupture, they could break. Suddenly we've got issues with the heart getting provided their oxygen and nutrients, heart attack. Okay? Right. Cholesterol. This is similar to what I was saying with sort of increased fat. You know, cholesterol is, is a form of fat. Uh, and we do have two different types. I'll just put this here. We do have two different types. We do have LDL and HDL. LDL being low density, HDL being high density. Think low for no. Low for no. We do not want a buildup of low density lipoproteins. These are the ones that clog 
and stick to the inside of our vessels. If you just have a look at the picture there, look at the normal artery, look at the, look at the bad artery, look at the difference in space blood has. Shocking. What can cause that? Overconsumption of fat, overproduction and over overpresence of low density like proteins. Now foods, they fatty foods do have a combination of the two. So it's important that we are eating foods where we've got high density low lipoproteins coming in, but it's almost we need the trigger to, to set them off. We need the environment to be suited to high density lipoproteins to get to work. Because if we go for some low to moderate intensity exercise and there's this demand for energy, well, because it's low intensity, our body will go for fat supplies because we've got surplus oxygen and we can consume fat. Well, where are we going to get that fat from? Well, if we've got fat stored and lined in our blood vessels, we can chip away at that and convert that into energy release that we can convert into movement. That's when high density line proteins can come into it and they start to remove and break down low density lipoproteins. So LDL stick and clog up blood vessels. HDLs, high density lipoproteins, they take them off and they carry them through the blood for breakdown, storage, removal, consumption. So HDL, they're working for us to remove the buildup of the low density lipoproteins, which you can see here with this little little anagram, well not anagram, diagram I should say, where we've got the, the LDL dumping fats and the HDL trying to work at removing it. So too much LDL, we don't want that because that's going to restrict the space in the vessels, not going to be great for physical activity. HDLs are good because they remove the LDLs for breakdown, for consumption, and then we've got more space for blood to flow through the vessels to supply the heart, the body, wherever, with oxygenated and nutritious blood, or nutrient-rich blood. So, impact of physical activity on sport and fitness. Well, the heart is a muscle, and just like any muscle inside of the body, we know that hypertrophy can occur if regular stress is experienced. So if we regularly stress our heart, then we can we can force cardiac hypertrophy. It becomes bigger, stronger, more pliable. I'll put those words down there. Look at those lists of benefits. Look at that list of benefits. More forceful contractions. We've got increased stroke volume. If something is more pliable and more elastic, it can stretch you, well, using less force. Or it can stretch further under the same amount of force. So as venous return comes up, the myocardium walls are more likely to expand under that pressure. Therefore, more blood can fit in. Therefore, more blood can be ejected out. We can eject more blood out. Cardiac output goes up. And if we can do all of these things, suddenly we can arrive at bradycardia. Resting heart rate sub 60 BPM. Why is that a good thing? Well, your heart's not beating as often. And if you think about it from you know, how, how, however old you are now, all the way through to death, which is a, little bit, a little bit morbid, but your heart's beating every single, maybe second, or more than, more than every second, every single second, every single day, every single week, month, year, decade, until your last one. But if we can reduce the amount of work that your heart needs to do, it's, going to, it's just going to be in a better condition later into life. If it doesn't have to be stimulated and contracted all the time, that's going to be a good thing. And it also allows it to be sort of in a position where it can sort of expand its output. It can increase what it is capable of so that when we do need to work at high intensity, it's got so much more room to sort of reach its optimal performance. You know, if you're, if you're beating at 50 BPM when you're at rest, then you could go up to, let's just say, let's just take 200 as the rough ballpark figure for maximum heart rate. If we're at 50 and we're resting, we've got 150 BPM to increase into from resting levels to maximum intensity. That's pretty impressive. Whereas if you, that's, what's that, 300%, 300% increase on top of your resting heart rate. Whereas if you're out of shape, I hate that phrase, 
But if you're not as physically healthy and your cardiovascular system hasn't experienced hypertrophy and you're not in bradycardia and your resting heart rate is 80, 85, 90 BPM, well, you're probably not going to be able to get to 200 BPM regardless. So you might be able to get to 180, let's say. So 90 BPM resting, you've only got 100% difference between rest and maximum intensity. That range, that improvement isn't very large compared to the 50 to 200. So we've got a healthier, stronger heart that can provide our body with more, more oxygen, more nutrients. And oh, there you go, that echoes what I was just saying there. Our submax exercise, our maximum exercise levels start to jump up. It doesn't, it takes far more, far much more intensity and difficulty to strain our body compared with an unhealthy person or with someone without this cardiac hypertrophy going on. Okay, we'll leave the, uh, we'll leave the activity for today, um, but if you did want to sort of stop here and, and have a little think, um, then a bit of an internet activity, ejection fraction. Uh, I spoke a little bit just then about sort of the expansion um, of, the, of the chambers of the heart due to venous return, and how elastic slides can lead to more fill well, that's, link, that's one half of ejection fraction. So maybe have a little look into what ejection fraction is. Um, and also cholesterol. You know, what impact does cholesterol have on our physical performance and all-round health? Moving on, though. Moving on. If we were to uh, leave those for, for another time, I now want to talk about hormonal, neural, and chemical regulation. So how do we actually... Yes, we're responding to exercise, but... How do we control the cardiovascular system? What is it inside of our body that actually you know, controls it? You know, there must be a switch, there must be something in charge of the changes that occur. Well, before we start to exercise, we've got something called anticipatory rise. Anticipatory rise. Now this is when our heart rate sees this slight increase or spike in BPM in anticipation of the exercise to come. Now what causes that anticipation? Well, our other senses. Are we looking at something that's about to happen? Have we heard the countdown or the, an not the anticipation, I don't want to use the word in the definition, but can we hear the stimuli? Can we see the stimuli? Is there a countdown? Now, is, there, is there reason for us to believe that we're about to be physically active? Okay, and if there is, our heart, or our body secretes adrenaline, and what the, the impact of adrenaline is that it, it increases the sort of the rate and the rate and speed, let's say, the rate and speed of neurotransmissions in the context of this from brain to heart. So speed and rate. Okay, speed. It, you know, the one so when uh, an impulse is is fired from the cardiac control center, it comes down the sympathetic nervous system, and we'll cover this in, in a little bit more detail, but that impulse is fired down that sympathetic nervous system, well, with adrenaline flooding the nervous system, the speed of that taking place goes up. So every neurotransmission, every you know, piece of data getting sent down the nervous system, that's gonna happen faster. The rate is then how often those impulses are sent. So we've got more impulses happening per, per minute, and we've got each one of those traveling at a faster speed and arriving at the cardiac muscle in a shorter space of time. Overall effect, we're gonna create this more powerful change. Now that impulse hits the muscle all at once, not over a slightly delayed signal. And if it all goes in at the same time, the response to the change is gonna happen harder and faster. So what, what, what impact does that have? A more forceful contraction, not this slower, more sustained contraction. It's all gonna happen at once. And that is gonna increase in rate, again, because of adrenaline. What impact does that have? Well, so then, in the second point down, it helps prepare the body for exercise because we've now got a heart beating harder and faster, flooding our body with oxygenated blood. We haven't even moved yet but we're preempting the demand for oxygen that's about to come. 
So now when we do actually eventually start to exercise or move and energy demands go up, oxygen is already on its way inside the muscle towards the mitochondria to try and into aerobic exercise sooner, a cleaner, more efficient, more economical energy pathway. It's also known as a fight or flight response because this spike in adrenaline way back when, if we go back to more primitive mind, the release of adrenaline can either get you ready for you know, whatever the fight is to come or it's going to help you run away nice and quickly. So yeah, we've got that last point there. Uh, adrenaline has the effect of increasing the speed and the quality of the impulses. The cardiac contractions are going to change. So, vascular shunt. We know that we are we're getting ready for exercise. We've got that adrenaline spike going on. We've now got a reprioritization, let's call it, of where that blood now needs to go. Vascular shunt is the way in which that we control that. So because, let's say we go for a cycle ride, our cycle ride isn't really going to be demanding much from our arms. Maybe some stability, but not a lot else. The main demands are going to be experienced in the legs. So what we end up seeing is this, this trigger, this data being collected from our receptors inside of our body. Uh, I'll put this up here. We get these triggers from around our body, from the receptors, which, which tell the brain, well, they don't really tell the brain because the brain still has to make up the decision in the end, but they're just transmitting messages and data, allowing the brain to paint this picture of where in the body is working. Now the brain can decide, well, if there's a demand in the legs, I can switch on more vessels to direct more blood toward the direction of the legs. The arms, not a lot's changed up there. There's not a lot of movement, not a lot of energy demand. Therefore, won't give it much oxygen, won't give it much blood. I can take the, the savings, almost, of what I'm no longer sending to the arms, and I can force that towards the legs. So if you have a look at these two diagrams on the left-hand side, We've got pre up at the top and post down at the bottom, vascular shunt. If you think of it almost like I've always described it as like spreading jam. Now think of jam as if you had a jam jar full of blood, that's your volume, that's all you've got. And if you've got 10 slices of toast in front of you, you could spread the whole jar pretty evenly across all 10 slices. But what if you knew that five of them weren't being eaten? Well, you could double up on your portions of jam on the other five that are going to be eaten. So we can prioritise where we spend our resources. The volume of the resource, the jam, the blood, doesn't change. We've still got the same volume, but we can choose to put more into the areas that need it, that have the demand. How do we achieve that? We constrict blood vessels. Precapillary sphincters can block off blood flow from going past them. If we know that we've got a capillary bed that's about to you know, service the bicep and tricep for this cyclist, well the pre-capillary sphincter can gradually close up, it's almost like a donut of, of, of muscle almost. Um, so we've got this donut which can, if, if we shrink that down, it has that effect of, you know, it makes it harder for blood to actually pass through it. And if blood rushing past this cap uh, capillary bed can't get through, and it's going to keep on moving. It's going to keep on going to a place where, what's the phrase, um, following the path of least resistance. So we shut off the capillary beds running to the arms and we dilate or relax the sphincters for the capillary beds supplying the legs with blood. So now we're seeing this diversion, this shunt of blood flow to places of higher demand away from places of lower demand. So we've got pre-capillary sphincters, first of all. We've got vasoconstriction, which means you know, to make tighter, to constrict the space. And we've got vasodilation, just like our pupils, with the change of light, they dilate and constrict. Same thing with our blood vessels. You know, because of the control from the vasomotor control center, our brain can, can stimulate the smooth muscle that surrounds our blood vessels and it can relax the muscle to allow it to, to take more blood through it, or it can stimulate the muscle to contract in, to reduce the volume, therefore less blood 
can flow through. Vascular shunt or blood redistribution. Cardiac and nerve conduction system. So before we go into things like chemoreceptors and proprioceptors and things like that, I quickly want to talk about the cardiac conduction system. Because I spoke earlier about adrenaline and how if we secrete adrenaline, then the impulses arrive at a faster rate and with a stronger signal, stronger quality. They all arrive at one time. Well, then what? How does this impulse convert thought or brain stimulus into a beating heart, into a contraction? We've got the cardiac conduction system. It's almost the electrical components which transmit and transfer this impulse through the heart, creating the changes which allows and causes the heart to then contract. Well, first of all, it's myogenic. So it's self-sufficient. There's always going to be this production of impulse from, from, the, from the heart itself. What our brain can do is accelerate or decelerate this myogenic impulse. Okay? Acceleration is sympathetic nervous system. The way I remember it is if we're feeling tired because we're exercising, our brain has sympathy for us, so it makes things easier by increasing our heart rate. So sympathetic nervous system, increase heart rate with faster impulses. Parasympathetic is then when we want to slow these impulses down. Think parasympathetic, para for parachute. If you use the parachute from a skydive, it then slows you down. So sympathetic, parasympathetic, these two channels that send impulses and transmit these neurotransmissions to arrive at the heart to either accelerate or decelerate. Then what? Well, this impulse hits the SA node, or the sinoatrial node. And it's in the top half of the heart. If you look at that picture there, where you can just about see it as a battery diagram or battery picture. Now that SA node sits just at the top of our two atria. Remember, atria at the top, ventricles at the bottom, A, V. So the atria are up at the top. The SA node, the sinoatrial node, takes this impulse, arriving at various rates and strengths from the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nerves. It arrives at the SA node, and it then emits it through the atrial walls. We've got this stimulation of the, the myocardium, which is the cardiac muscle layer, surrounding the atrial walls. And when that muscle gets stimulated by this impulse, or well, have a little think. If you get an electric shock or static from the door, what's your reaction? It's probably going to be to jump or to contract or to tense up. Same thing with our atria. We pass this impulse into the walls, it stimulates atria contraction or systole. Okay, when a chamber or muscles in the heart are stimulated and they're contracting, we call it systole. So the sinoatrial node passes the impulse through the atrial wall, causing them to contract. They enter, they enter systole. Okay. Now what? Well, this impulse has just caused atria to contract. It's on its way through, it's past the atria, and it arrives at the atrioventricular node. The AV node. Okay. Atrioventricular because it sits in the middle of the atria chambers and the ventricle chambers. Now, if our two chambers are up here, A and A, two atria, and our ventricles are down here, where my thumbs meet, that's where my AV is atrioventricular. What's the job of the atrioventricular? Well, it's there to accept the impulse from the sinoatrial node, and it causes a bit of a delay. It holds on to it, and we're talking a split second. We're talking about the length of time, if you think of a heart rate, it's the time difference between clap one and clap two, between do do because that allows different valves to close up and blood flow to occur throughout the heart. So the atrioventricular node accepts this impulse, it passes it down the septum of the heart through the bundle of his. Then the bundle of his, these cables, these wires, then pass it into the Purkinje fibres. The Purkinje fibres almost 
almost like roots of a plant, you know, spread out and nestle and weave around the base of the ventricles. And as soon as those receive the impulse and spread it into the vent ventricle myocardium, they contract too. So this impulse from the brain comes down through sympathetic or parasympathetic to speed up or decelerate. SA node emits that impulse, atrial contraction. Impulse arrives at the AV node, delay. Down the bundle of his, into the Purkinje fibres, into the ventricle walls, ventricular contraction. And that is a heart. Do do. Atrial ventricle. Do do. Do do. And there we go. Just that little part there about the SNS and the PNS. Green and red, SNS speeds up, PNS slows down. SNS is what we need and what we call on in response to exercise. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system, that can help us return back to resting levels. Have a little read through that. Okay, carbon dioxide. So we've, already, so we've spoken now about hormonal control. We've spoken about neural control, SNS, PNS. Now we have carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide is obviously a gas. And we produce carbon dioxide when we start to exercise. Due to aerobic, aerobic uh, energy pathways. You know, if we take glucose, and we you know, add that to oxygen and a couple of enzymes and we convert it, then we release energy, we release water, and we release carbon dioxide. So the more we get into exercise, the more aerobic energy we're, we're, we're using or supplying to our, to our working muscles, the more carbon dioxide we're going to be producing inside the muscle. Well, where is this carbon dioxide then taken to? Because if it's in the muscle, we need to get that because too much carbon dioxide, that can create this, this, this slightly acidic, it can cause a, a bit of a drop in pH because carbonic acid can be formed as a result. So we need to get rid of carbon dioxide. So it goes into the blood, in the plasma, or attaches to the red blood cells, and sorry, hemoglobin, and forms carbamina hemoglobin, and it gets transported up towards our, or through the cardiovascular system, up towards our heart, up towards our lungs, so we can then breathe out. So when we start to exercise, it stands to reason that our heart is going to experience an increase in carbon dioxide levels in the blood that is being returned to the heart. And that's where we have these chemoreceptors. If you have a look at that diagram on the right hand side there, we've got this aortic chemoreceptor the carotid body or chemoreceptor. We've got these, these almost antenna, these testers, almost dipsticks that are in the blood. So as the blood passes it, it can take a quick reading of how much carbon dioxide is currently in that blood. Now that alone doesn't cause any changes. The receptors are just there to pick up data. They then send that message to the brain the brain then realises, hold on, we're having carbon dioxide influx all around the body, especially in the blood that's coming back to the heart. How do I get rid of it? Beat more, beat harder, and I need to change the respiratory system as well, but we'll get into that. But, for, but the, main, the main response of the CCC, the cardiac control centre, is when the chemoreceptors detect this increase in carbon dioxide, cardiac output needs to increase get that blood flowing around the body faster, more of it per minute, so that we can collect this buildup of CO2, bring it back up to the heart, into the lungs, to then get rid of it. There you go, just move my face out of the way. So have a read through this, everything, everything that we just said. So aerobic respiration produces that CO2 as a byproduct. When O2 drops, because we're consuming it through aerobic energy pathways, and CO2 levels rise, acidity might start to change, partial pressures of oxygen and CO2 are going to change, 
It's the chemoreceptors that detect these changes, pass this information up to the brain, the brain, the cardiac control center within the medulla. That can then make the decisions on, okay, do I need to increase heart rate? Do I need to increase cardiac output? Yes, no, how much? Just a little, maximally. So it's always getting this data and the messages to then cause changes to cardiac control. So again, we could we could oh you, you could take a take a break um, and just have a little answer of those have a look through those questions there. Uh, we're not going to stop today, but if you are watching this on on a repeat or uh, or if you're watching it live, then obviously you can go back in on the repeat and give these a go. Just a couple of questions to summarise where we where we've been so far. Right, moving on. So receptors, here we go. This sort of this brings together everything that we've been that we've been talking about so far. Neural control, carbon dioxide, everything. So, what are the different zones? Well, intrinsic, neural, and hormonal. The intrinsic control, this is more physical changes. So it's less about changes in acidity, it's less about changes in hormones. It's more to do with as the body physically moves, how does the physical signs, or what physical signs are there, which, which suggest that the body is starting to move? Or well, venous return is the first one. Venous return being the volume of blood that's currently returning from the body up to the heart, and thermoreceptors, or, or the temperature, I should say. So as we start to move more, our muscles are contracting, our limbs are moving, all of which apply pressure and change the impact that gravity has on the blood and it causes more blood to return to the heart. More blood returning to the heart means that there's going to be some stretching going on inside of our right atria. Why? Well, because if our right atria is sitting there and accepting blood back from the vena cava and suddenly, every single second, we've got twice the volume coming in well, that right atrium is going to expand more. There's going to be more stretch going on. The pressure inside of that right atria is going to spike. That's a signal detected by the stretch receptors and baroreceptors, which you can see there from the neural control. You can start to see is going to impact on the changes. So venous return, more blood coming back, leads to a change because we can now sense that if more blood's coming back, that must mean we're exercising, we need to change something. Thermoreceptors, they're dotted around the body, in joints, in our blood vessels, in our muscles. They're there to detect changes in temperature. And if we're exercising, I always say this to my students, always say what direction a change is occurring. So never just say, we exercise, temperature changes, and thermoreceptors are there. How is it changing? Is it going up, is it going down, is it going sideways? Always say the direction of a change. So thermoreceptors, they detect this increase in temperature. Why? Well, joints are moving. There's friction. There's this cellular metabolism, this release of energy from the breakdown of, of, of foods and chemical compounds like glucose and free fatty acids. We're breaking these down. Yes, we release energy to resynthesize ATP, but a byproduct of, of all of this is heat energy. And if we're doing that, you know, in the, in the centre of muscles, then heat's got to go out. It's going to be absorbed by the surrounding tissue. Thermoreceptors are there to pick that up. Neural control. I won't go into too much on these because we have already spoken about them quite a bit. But we have baro, proprio, chemoreceptors. The neurological control system. These neurons, or the receptors attached to the end of a neuron, these neurons run up to our cardiac control centre with the data, with the message, brain can then make a decision. Baroreceptors, pressure. Think about that stretch. Think about blood pressure, that it starts to go up inside the vessels because we're starting to put more blood out or because venous return is starting to decrease because a muscle is contracting around the vessel and squeezing it. Baroreceptors detect that. Proprioceptors, muscle tension, muscle fiber movement, joint movement. And then chemoreceptors, think chemochemical. They detect changes in O2PP, 
partial pressure. Not air pressure, not baroreceptors, but partial pressure, the concentration of gases in certain mixtures, let's call it. And then hormonal, obviously we've already spoken about these as well. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, uh, very similar, but it's just that speed and the quality and the rate of impulses getting sent around. And then acetylcholine, that's there to sort of bring us back down. So how the parasympathetic nervous system can kick in to reduce the speed, acetylcholine is there to, to sort of support that. So it insulates the sinoatrial node and the impulses pro and the, the, the neurons providing the SA node with the impulse, with the stimulation. Acetylcholine can just slow things down. Adrenaline speeds things up. Right, O2 transportation. So how do we get things around the body? Keep on doing that. There we go. So how do we actually get it around the body? Why do we get it around the body? Uh, what's the point? So first of all, uh, it attaches onto a hemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin. So as our cardiovascular system responds to exercise, we're trying to increase blood flow. Why? Because it's stuffed full of oxygen. Why do we need to get more oxygen around? Because there's higher energy demands in the body, or in the muscles, I should say, when we're talking about sport. If we just have a big meal, then the stomach demand for oxygen goes up. Therefore, using vascular shunt and redistribution, we give more oxygenated blood to our stomach. But if we're just talking about in the context of sport, we want to get our working muscles as much oxygen as we can. Why? That bottom point there. To allow this sufficient supply so that exercise can persist. Because when we're exercising, we need constant ATP. How do we get ATP efficiently? Aerobic energy pathway. What do we require to access the aerobic energy pathway? Oxygen. So we have to make sure that we're transporting oxygen. How do we actually get oxygen in? Well, that's our, that's our diffusion. That's our ability to actually you know, move oxygen from an area of high pressure into an area of low pressure. Again, not air pressure, partial pressure. Now, if you had two glasses of Ribena, well, let's say, no, let's say one, one big glass of Ribena, and you put a divider in, and you poured Ribena on one half, really strong and concentrated, and on the other half, really weak and diluted. If you were to then take that divider out, Ribena from the high pressure side is going to flow into the low pressure until the two sides are balanced out. And now you've got everything of the same level of concentration. The volume hasn't changed, just the, the concentrations of Ribena on each side have changed. That's our diffusion gradient. Here we go, partial pressure and diffusion. The diffusion gradient is when we have this difference in partial pressure. That one side of Ribena, very strong. The other side of the glass, very diluted. High pressure, low pressure. High concentration, low concentration. If they're able to mix, if these, if these two substances are given the chance to, to sort of relate to each other and to react with each other, we start to see this mixing until we reach equilibrium. Okay. So when we're talking about oxygen transportation, obviously we take big breaths in, lots of air, which contains with it your standard amount of oxygen. Oxygen can transfer, can diffuse into the blood flow that's currently in the lungs. And that we'll get to that in the respiratory system. But now the blood can flow around the body and it can reach the working muscles. It's got high amounts of oxygen in the blood. Well, if we were to compare this high amount of oxygen in the blood to the relatively low oxygen in the muscle because we because it's been consumed because we're using aerobic energy because we're you know t converting oxygen into almost water essentially um, but we're, we're getting rid of that oxygen so now we've got high and low we've got this gradient so when this oxygenated blood does arrive at we'll just call it oxygen starved muscle we've got this gradient if they if they have the chance to respond we get this movement, oxygen from the high area transfer, transfers, it diffuses into the area of low pressure, into the muscle. Here we go. 
So we have the alveoli diffusion and we have the capillary diffusion. alveolar diffusion and capillary diffusion. Now obviously you can see on the left hand side there this blood capillary which is just it's cut, it's coming back from the rest of the body so it's, it's just dropped off all of its oxygen to the working muscle so its level of oxygen or concentration is going to be very weak in this blood coming back to our lungs and the lungs is just breathed in it's just got loads more of fresh air into the lungs with high high concentrations of oxygen so now we've got an area of low and high. Low in the blood, high in the lungs. So as this blood volume travels past, the high concentration transfers, diffuses into this low concentration area. So now we've got lots more oxygen inside the blood. The high level is now here, and that goes off to the rest of the body, where capillary diffusion now takes place, which is, that's exactly what we've just been talking about. High amounts of oxygen inside the blood, low amounts inside the working muscle, diffusion gradient means that oxygen diffuses from an area of high down to the low. And that's how we get oxygen into the blood and out of the blood. Which leads us to the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Now this one is, it's a, it's a trickier concept to understand, but it's essentially... If you were to take an individual who was resting and an individual who was exercising, at two, play, at two points in their bodies, so we've got the rester and the, and the worker, at two places in the body that are the same level of oxygen starved, so let's say there's you know, half the amount of oxygen in one muscle and half the amount of oxygen in their muscle, the rester isn't going to add new oxygen to the starved area at a high rate. The worker, on the other hand, who also has an area that's 50% depleted, is going to deposit loads of oxygen into that starved area. So once blood flow passes the, the, the starved area, the worker will end up with more oxygen inside their starved area compared to the rester. So the, the rate of oxygen dissociation increases when we start to exercise. So if you were to compare two sites of the same level of oxygen, same level of starvation, if you're currently exercising, then more oxygen is going to be deposited into your starved area compared to if you were just resting. We've got a greater dump of oxygen into that starved area. Why? That's the question. Okay, we know how oxygen comes in. We know that hemoglobin becomes oxyhemoglobin. We know about diffusion gradients now. But what causes this change in dissociation, this increased rate of oxygen dissociation when we start to exercise? Well, there's twofold, two reasons. I'll, I'll talk through this, this graph in a second. It's increased temperature and increased acidity. So it's two physical changes, these intrinsic changes. Because when we start to exercise, we've already said heat's released, friction causes heat, we see temperatures rise, which means blood temperature is going to rise, which means oxyhemoglobin temperature is going to rise. That's reason number one. We're also producing lactic acid through anaerobic respiration. We're also producing carbon dioxide, aerobic respiration, both of which can cause pH levels to drop, which signifies a more acidic environment. So we're now exercising, and everything's more acidic, and everything's warmer. Those two factors invite oxygen, or cause oxygen, to jump ship more readily. Oxygen is more likely to leave their haemoglobin carrier and join the myoglobin carrier, which is inside the muscle, at a faster and greater rate. It's easier for oxygen to leave and join myoglobin when it's hotter and more acidic. So that's it. 
Now I know the, the graph and everything and the sound of it can, can look complex, but it's essentially oxygen finds it easier to leave its hemoglobin and go into the muscle when it's hotter and more acidic. You need to be able to say, well, what causes those changes? We're moving, therefore we've got heat byproduct. We're creating and producing CO2 and lactic acid. Those two factors cause a hotter environment and a more acidic environment. Now this graph, this is this almost what we were saying earlier about the rester and the worker and the high levels and low levels of, of uh, oxygen transfer. But if you take the red line here, it's the resting dissociation rate. So along the dashed line there, that's what, 70 partial pressure. So if you have an area in the muscle with 70 partial pressure and you're currently resting, if you were to follow that line up and then across, once the blood goes past that area of 70 partial pressure, only 10% left. There's still 90% of the blood oxygen retained inside of that blood. Only 10% was, was dropped off at that site with 70 partial pressure of oxygen. Think of it like a sponge. It's filled up 100% when it leaves the heart. It goes past a bucket that is 70% full and it only squeezes 10% of its water into that bucket. Now, if you are exercising, if you are in a hotter and more acidic state, that same muscle with the same 70 pp of oxygen, that same bucket filled 70% of the way up. Now that you're exercising, that sponge, which was 100% filled up, now squeezes 20% of its oxygen into this 70% filled up bucket. Nothing's different in terms of diffusion gradient or anything like that. It's just hotter and more acidic. We get a greater rate of oxygen dissociation. More oxygen or oxygen is more readily dissociating from the hemoglobin, attaching to the myoglobin and entering the muscle when we exercise. Just to recap what this is called, it's the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, also known as the Bohr shift, B-O-H-R shift. You can describe it as this shift to the right when you're talking about the graph. This shift to the right, Bohr shift. There you go, the Bohr effect, Bohr shift. Why? Because it's hotter, it's more acidic. I'll just move my face out of the way for you. Exercise increased abduction of CO2, reduces the pH, temperature is going up, oxygen is more likely to dissociate from the hemoglobin and enter the muscle. So if you did want to stop, here we go. There's a couple of questions to, to consider, to pause, pause the video and, and give those a go. Oh, again, move my face out of the way. <laughs> If you want to pause it and go for it, which is a bit, a little bit of drawing and labelling to do with the uh, association curve just then, and a bit of a sum up of you know, how oxygen is, is delivered around the body. Right, we are going to move on and we are into the last part now. Okay, so our fourth stage um, of the cardiovascular system. We are going to take a look at the Frank Starling Law. So, Frank Starling Law is well, it's to do with cardiac output and venous return and the relationship between the two. Because we can't, we can't increase cardiac output until venous return has increased. Now I use the analogy of a, a glass of water. In okay, case so you've got the tap running, so blood is flowing you know, out of this tap and into your glass. If you needed to put a fire out, and all you've got is this one glass and this one tap, you're not going to be able to make any difference to putting out that fire if you just keep on emptying the heart, emptying the glass, at a faster rate. Because you're capped, you're limited by the amount of blood, the amount of water flowing into your glass. So it doesn't matter if you wait for it to fill to the brim, you then empty it. Or you go half fill, empty, half fill, empty, twice as quick. You're limited by the flow of water out of the tap and into your glass. Same with the heart. We can't eject more blood. We can't, 
we can't deal with demands and satisfy oxygen delivery by just beating faster because our heart is limited by the amount of blood that flows into it which we can then eject out. So we have to get more blood flowing into it first so that we can then start to get more out of it. How do we, or what do we call that blood coming back? Venus return. So Frank Starling law, we can't increase cardiac output until Venus return has increased. What is Venus return? Well, we've got the mechanisms of smooth muscle pump, skeletal muscle pump, respiratory pump, pocket valves, gravity to an extent, atrial suction. You know, these, these mechanisms that help draw blood from this reservoir of stored blood inside of our veins, this low pressure blood, which is just sitting inside of our veins, waiting to trickle back to the heart to then get pushed out again. It's almost like waiting in a queue. Really quick, you know, really quick round one way, and then you're stuck at the back of the line waiting to get pushed out again. Well, when we start, when we start to exercise, this queue, this line, is suddenly all shoved up into the heart, and the whole thing can now start to increase. There's no waiting period. Everything's moving quickly. Starling's law. Cardiac output won't increase until venous return increases before. Here we go, the mechanisms. Skeletal muscle pump. As we're exercising, oh, and myself again. So venous return is the process of moving blood residing in the veins back to the right hand side of the heart. What things have we got at our disposal? Skeletal muscle pump. We start to move, our muscles start to contract. As a result, as they change shape, they might press and compress on the, on the blood vessels, which then presses on the blood, which increases blood pressure and blood flow. We've got, number two, pocket valves. Almost the doors that slam shut behind blood. Every time it takes two steps forward inside of a vein, the pocket valves open, allows the blood to flow through and then closes behind them. So if pressure does drop and blood flows backwards, well it's going to stop and rest on those pocket valve doors. So they open one way, but they don't go the other. It's almost like the top of the Lucozade cap. You know, the one where if you build the pressure up, it's very hard to put water back in or Lucozade back in, but it's quite easy to you know, squirt the Lucozade through that, that cap, that valve. So skeletal muscle pumps squeeze the vessels Blood is forced through the valve, the valves close up, blood can't come back. And gradually we've got this almost two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, and gradually, it's almost like a tube of toothpaste, and we gradually work that blood back towards the heart. Atrial suction is this, the change in shape of the atria, this right atrium. Every time it compresses, the pressure obviously increases and the volume you know, reduces, and blood's ejected. As it expands, you know, a, a volume that is growing and the contents isn't, the pressure begins to drop. So we've now got an area of low pressure drawing outwards inside the right atrium. Well, that low pressure environment inside the right atrium is lower than the blood pressure inside the vena cava and the venous system. High pressure, low pressure. We know that things move from high to low. So it's the same way that you, you can use your, use your mouth on a straw to drink a drink through a straw. You basically expand the space inside of your mouth to create this low pressure zone compared to the, the pressure inside the fluid. And the fluid then is drawn up through the straw into your mouth to drink. Same thing with the atria. Increase the volume. We draw the fluid, blood, through the straw, which is the vena cava, into the right atrium. Smooth muscle, that's the, the lining, almost like if you were to injure your elbow and wear a sort of a compression sleeve, um, that's almost what the smooth muscle is around your, around your blood vessels or your veins, and our vasomotor control centre can stimulate it to contract it. It's also, the motion is sort of known as peristalsis. you won't need to know that, uh, but peristalsis is this sort of wave-like contraction, similar to our intestines as well. Uh, so smooth muscle around our vessels can contract, can increase the pressure and squeeze the blood back. And then lastly, respiratory pump. 
similarly, or works very similarly to the skeletal muscle pump. As we breathe in, the lungs expand, the rib cage expands, that whole thoracic zone goes out and up. The vessels caught between it and our skin experience a bit of a squeeze, just as the space becomes constricted, pressure increases, blood is forced through the vessels. And lastly, lastly, we have AVO2 diff, or arterial venous oxygen difference. I'll put myself up here. Arterial venous oxygen difference. Now we'll break this, we'll break this title down. Arterial venous, artery, vein. What's in between an artery and a vein? A capillary bed and living tissue. So in the context of sport, we'll go for a muscle. So artery, capillary bed and muscle, vein. So we're going to be talking about the oxygen difference between the artery and a vein before and after the blood inside of them visits the capillary bed and the muscle. What is the change in the oxygen? Well, it's to do with the partial pressures. Do we see a higher pressure or a higher partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries or the veins? What causes the, any changes that do happen? And what do these changes signify for the level of fitness of the, of the performer? Well, first of all, we know that arteries are leaving the heart after just visiting the lungs, therefore partial pressure of oxygen in, in arteries is sky high. That's where we have our highest partial pressures. In our veins, well, we know that we've just been utilizing oxygen inside of the muscle. Therefore, our supply has been used, therefore we've got less oxygen inside of our veins. So face value, arterial venous oxygen difference, there, will, there should be, there must be a drop in oxygen levels from arteries to veins. What causes that? Energy demands in whatever the living tissue was, that was between the artery and vein. So for a working muscle, high oxygen demand. Why? Aerobic energy to meet ATP resynthesis demands. Why? So that we can carry on exercising. So when does AVO2 difference change? During exercise. Because there's more demand inside the muscle. So we must be seeing a greater dissociation of oxygen from haemoglobin into the muscle. Therefore, there's gonna be less left over that we can measure inside of the vein on the other side. What? Differences do we see when we're an athlete compared to your average Joe? Well, our, our body becomes efficient. The more we train it, the more we stress it, the more we force it to do something, it adapts and gets better. So if we constantly go for moderate to high intensity training or physical activity or exercise, whatever it might be, and we, and we challenge our body to respire aerobically for extended periods of time, our body is going to develop a higher quantity of aerobic enzymes. It's going to develop a more efficient attraction for oxygen. We're going to be losing, perhaps, you know, body fat. Now, not necessarily on the, in, the, in, the, in the outer layers, but this, this internal fat, which could be lining the inside of the arterial and venous walls, or that could be lining inside the muscle. But if we can get rid of that, then we're gonna be able to pass more oxygen more red or through through that layer from blood into muscle far more easily. We're going to have capillarization. We're going to grow this network of capillaries. We're going to get a bigger bed of capillaries surrounding the muscle, so that we can actually there's more opportunity to get oxygen out of the blood. The muscle is going to be bigger because of uh, muscular hypertrophy. So we've got more muscle demanding more oxygen. And it's going to get it because we've got more capillaries and it's going to be easier for the oxygen to get out of the blood into the muscle because we've got less fat stopping it. We've got more aerobic enzymes that are able to cope with this increased delivery of oxygen. Overall impact, we see a better uptake in our trained performers compared to untrained performers. So they're going to be better at uptaking more. Therefore, when we see AVO2 diff between untrained and trained being the same, when we see them as being the same, our trained performer will likely be working at a higher intensity 
because they can sustain that level of high intensity with the same amount of oxygen as the untrained performer at the low intensity. Okay, so AVO2 difference, the ability to take oxygen out from the blood vessels and put it into the muscle because of capillary beds, because of oxygen demand, and because of oxygen dissociation. Cardiovascular drift. And this is the last thing. So cardiovascular drift is when, despite exercise intensity staying the same, so if you see that blue line there, so the pace of a run stays the same, but heart rate gradually drifts up towards the end of exercise. Cardiovascular drift. What causes it? Well, a couple of things. First of all, we need to think about the changes going on inside of our body. How, how else has our body responded to exercise? Well, we need to thermoregulate. How do we thermoregulate? Well, one thing could be to sweat, because water retains heat, and so if we can sweat and get rid of the water, get rid of the hot water, that's going to help us. Well, where do we get that water from? Well, some of that water is drawn from the plasma. So our blood volume begins to reduce if we exercise for a long period of time and we're trying to thermoregulate. We start to lose blood volume because we're losing water through sweat to help us thermoregulate. So we've now got less blood flowing around our body. What's another way that we can thermoregulate? and reduce our body temperature, keep it close to our core temperature. Well, we can pass blood, hot blood, near the surface of the skin, acting like a radiator. How does a radiator work in a house? You put hot water into this metal object and heat radiates off of it. Same thing with our body. If we put hot water, not hot water, hot blood underneath our skin, the heat radiates out into the environment. So we've got less blood because we're sweating and we now need to try and pass that reduced volume of blood to more areas of the body because if we're exercising let's say we're running our legs probably our core are probably going to be getting the majority of our blood flow leg muscles core muscles keep us moving keep us upright but now we also need to reduce our temperature by putting some of that blood to the to the extremities as well and we've got less blood to do it. I'll go back to my analogy of the, the jam on toast scenario. What we've just done is, if we had you know, the 10 pieces of toast, and we, we've already said that if we reduce it down to five slices of toast, we can double up on each of them. Well, what we're essentially doing here is, right, we're exercising, we've needed these five, now I need to send it to the surface of my skin on the legs. Now I need to uh, send it to the surface of the skin on my arms. So suddenly I, I can no longer double up my jam. I now need to spread it more thinly because I've got more areas to send that blood. But I've got less blood. So I've got less jam in the jam jar to start with. So I've got to cover more of the body with an ever reducing volume of blood. How do I cope with that? Because I need the cardiac output to stay the same. I'm gonna to have to beat my heart faster. So cardiac drift. It's this reduction in blood volume due to sweating, due to thermoregulation. It's also the reliance on blood redistribution to the skin surface for thermoregulation. Less blood, more places to serve. Net result, well, we need to keep cardiac output the same. And if we know that stroke volume and heart rate equate to cardiac output, what's one thing, one part of the equation I can change there? heart rate. Increase heart rate while stroke volume comes down to try and keep cardiac output the same. Cardiovascular drift. As we start to exercise we need to thermoregulate so we sweat and reduce our blood volume. We also need to send blood to the surface of the skin to radiate heat, increasing the amount of areas that demand blood flow. So we dilate the vessels near the skin increasing the distance that the reducing amount of blood needs to flow through. Less blood gets back to the heart each time, therefore stroke volume drops. And if we need to balance our stroke volume and heart rate so that we achieve the same cardiac output, 
If stroke volume drops, we must increase heart rate. Cardiovascular drift. And that brings us right up to the end. So that was the cardiovascular system. I know that was a that was a long old um, <laughs> a long old talk through there, but hopefully that's all of the key points that you'll need for your exam, for your revision, and obviously this will be recorded and uploaded, so you can jump in, jump out of it as much as you need, but it's just all there in one place uh, for you to use. I know that you know, we spoke about these, these timeouts during the presentation. Hopefully now you can go back in and have a look at the questions that were there and, and give, those, give those a bit of a tackle. But yes, that is, that is it, cardiovascular system done. I hope the YouTube stream uh, did stay live, but if you're watching this on repeat, Fantastic. Uh, if you are watching this on repeat, then look in, look in the link below. We are doing uh, live A-level lessons on Tuesday and Thursday. And if you're watching this or know of someone doing GCSE, then we run GCSE live lessons Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So join the link, uh, register your interest, and you can be kept up to date with when we do go live. And you can also get the URL links to the replays sent to you as well. So if you're a teacher, feel free to use this with your class, especially during home learning, distance learning, everything like that. I know it's a little bit of a bit of a strange time at the moment, so I hope this managed to help out a little bit. I've been Johnny. Um, we, uh, or I work through the, the, the PE Tutor, so if you do want to check us out, then the PETutor.com, but you can you know, like this video, subscribe to the channel uh, to get very similar content to this uploaded as often as we can. Uh, but yeah, fantastic. See you later.